redeemed only beauty remained and my orphan heart was given the name my morning grew quiet my feet rose to dance when death was arrested my life Began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner.
the, uh, that's a new song that we just started singing this week. Um, this is March, and in a couple of weeks, we're going to be celebrating Easter, um, which is the foundational kind of day and hope for the Christian faith. That throughout history, um, Christians and the hope that we have isn't necessarily rooted in a book or tradition or even a large church, but that the hope of Christianity has always been rooted in this historical event where a man was murdered on a cross, put in a grave, and then three days later, the tomb was empty. And that event, not that idea, not that thought, but that event changed things. And that the Christians, this movement that came out of Judaism called Christianity that exploded and traveled all over the world and it's 2,000 years later is camped out in this room was born out of a hope and a power that if death could be conquered then nothing, no matter how big or how small stood within the path of God bringing victory to in our lives. And I think that it's not an empty promise it's not a it's false emotional sentiment that we sing death was arrested and life began. It's a quiet confidence. It says, if God can defeat death, then surely he can sustain me, carry me, enable me through whatever it is I'm facing right now. That all of us have walked in this room, no matter what our background, what our age, what our beliefs, all of us as humans have this one thing in common, that we live in a world that is hard sometimes. That there are struggles, there are insecurities, there are doubts. And just because we are people of faith doesn't mean we don't carry doubts. And that the, the confidence of the Christian faith is that in Jerusalem, there's still an empty tomb. Because Jesus was able to say, I'm good now. I just needed to borrow it for a few days. You can have it back. And in the midst of whatever maybe you've brought in, whether it's with your child, whether it's with your job, whether it's with your spouse, whether it's over some looming questions in life, just for you to, to be able to kind of take a pause and say, death was arrested. The biggest enemy ever was defeated. And that that God is present today, still bringing victory. And I just want to pray that and remind us of that because sometimes it's, it's kind of like you're in the middle of a football game and the clock's ticking down and the game's not over yet and you feel like, well, we've already lost. And it gets inside of your mind and before the game's even over, you're starting to walk around defeated. And I think sometimes just to be reminded that, no, there is a victory that's been accomplished and that we are all participants or we can all become participants with that victory. And shift the mindset in which we live, we, we, we live and process. And even as we move through this series of dealing with difficult things that we all face and struggle with, to know that March can be a month of victory, not defeat. I'm going to pray in that, and then I'll invite you to sit down, and we'll kind of jump into the teaching today. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that death was arrested. That you accomplished something. And that while we may not always understand fully the implications of that, we recognize that there are far more implications than we've probably ever considered. And so thank you that we are not gathered, that our songs are not about an idea, but it's about an event. And if that event had never occurred, we would be a pathetic group of people. But because of that event, there's a victory, there's a hope, and that the way we love and the way we live and the way we suffer and the way we endure looks differently because of it. And so I pray that you would speak today, Jesus, that you would um, instruct us that as we dive into the teaching today that we would find that you are at work, not just 2,000 years ago, but today as well. And it's in your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. You can have a seat.
Good morning. My name is Chris. Let me go ahead and introduce myself. I realized I didn't do that earlier. I'm the pastor of Encounter Church, and um, this this morning we we kick off a new series through the month of March that, as you can tell, um, deals with some of the harder things in life and deals with some of those moments where, um, I don't know what kind of household you grew up in, what some of the phrases were around your household, but for me, um, one of the phrases I heard was, what in the world, or why in the world, and it was usually accompanied with my full name, right? That there was just this sense that like, Brian, Christopher, Causey, what in the world were you thinking? And, um, and I usually knew when I heard that phrase that it was not going to be, you're the best son ever. It usually meant that I had been caught doing something that I thought I had not um, been discovered about yet, whatever. It was just like this, this phrase that I heard a lot. And I remember in fourth grade was kind of that moment for me where I used that phrase for the first time about my own life. I'd heard it from my mom about my life or my brother's life, but for me it was fourth grade. Um, I didn't grow up in a large city, but I grew up in what would only be categorized as an inner city environment. Um, my school system growing up was, was an incredibly um, bad system, uh, educationally speaking, even relationally, and just from from a safety standpoint. In fact, uh, as I got older, when President Obama and the multiple times that he has addressed our nation in the State of the Union, he has referenced um, my school district twice in the State of the Union as an example of how bad public education can be in America. And whenever he referenced it, whether it's in the State of the Union or in press conferences, um, I'll have friends who shoot me a text. They'll be like, yo, the president just gave you a shout out, right? And I'm like, I don't know if that's the kind of shout out I want that I grew up in one of the worst public schools in America. And that as a fourth grader, um, I remember walking in and learning that the bathroom was gang territory and that um, you didn't go to the bathroom during breaks, during transitions, because it meant that you could end up getting beat up, you could be robbed, and that if you really had to go, you, you waited till after everyone was in class, and then you would kind of form a pact, and, and, and a few of you would ask to go to the restroom together. Because it really was dangerous as a fourth grader to walk into the bathroom. And, um, and so there was one day where nature was calling and my plan was not going to work out and I kind of risked it and I walked into the bathroom during a break. And I walked in and sure enough, the moment the door closed behind me and everybody in the room turned around, I realized I had just stepped into a gang, me- gang meeting, which is a, a strange thing when you're a fourth grader to have an awareness that you just stepped into a gang meeting. And um, so I walked in. And trying to keep my head down because I've got business to take care of and that's all I want to do. And I kind of am walking through. And as I'm walking by one of the guys who, um, while he may have been in fourth grade, he should have been in like eighth grade. He shoves me. And I'm, I'm this kind of tall, like, I mean, this small little fourth grader. Um, I am not of the athletic variety, um, if you can say it that way. I am lanky. I, I couldn't control things. I was never gifted in any sports until I discovered soccer. So when I was pushed, naturally, I did what any fourth grader would do. I s- screamed like a small, small girl, and I flailed my arms as I went flying back. And, and I really, I apologize to the females, because I just defended you, not because I said I screamed like a girl, because if any, any girl had actually screamed the way I had screamed, it would have been offensive to them, right? I mean, that's how bad it was. I thrown into the bathroom stall went flailing, because he pushed me so hard. And in the midst of flying through the air flailing, like this is how I die, is in a toilet as a fourth grader, I hit someone accidentally, who says, oh, no, you didn't. And at that point, two guys begin to assault me and beat me up inside of a bathroom stall. The teacher comes running in because he hears my, like, borderline dog frequency scream. And he, he brings me out, and I go to the principal's office. And the principal um, asked everybody what happened. And I was like, I just had to go to the bathroom. And, and they were like, he hit me. And I remember being punished and, because I had been called fighting. And the way they, they punished you in that school, they did actually back then used to like give corporal punishment um, with 
pedals, paddles that had uh, like holes cut in them so they could be more aerodynamic. I mean, I, like I said, I grew up in a rough place. Um, but this principal wanted to teach us a lesson. So it was uh, kind of a hot sun, um, kind of hot sunny day. And he put us outside and he made us do 100 squats along the fence. And if we messed up, we'd have to start all over. And that was his like, I'm going to teach you boys that you're making bad decisions in life. And I remember around like 50 or 60, my legs are burning. I'm surrounded by two large guys. I have done nothing. And I was like, why in the world am I out here? And I'd like to say because, uh, well, you know, fourth grade was the last time I ever dealt with someone that was difficult. But the reality is, is that I grew up and in that school system, I continued to bump against difficult people. But as an adult now, maybe I can go to the bathroom and it's safe, but it's still moments where you bump into difficult people. They, they're not in a bathroom hanging out. They may be in a cubicle right beside you. Or they may, live in, they may be living in your same house as you. Or they may be your neighbor. But that this idea of dealing with difficult people isn't just something I experienced as a fourth grader and said, why in the world? It's something that we all do. We all bump into individuals in the course of life that are just difficult. We can't seem to get along. It just every time we have an interaction, it escalates. It gets worse. We have these fears about going to work, or we're concerned about sitting beside them in class, or we really hope that they don't make eye contact us with us as we kind of walk through the cafeteria. Like the difficult people are a reality in life, and it's not just in the physical world. It's in the social media realm too. That you, at least in fourth grade, I could escape those boys in the bathroom. Today's fourth graders, they go home and their social media is the avenue that they can continue to be tortured and bullied and ridiculed. And, and while it may be easy, even in the midst of an election season and the way that the news is covering, the way debates are happening and the way people are treating each other in this nation, it can be really easy to fall in the trap of looking at the election season, of looking at social media and think that somehow we have recently discovered how to be really difficult with one another. But the reality is that being difficult with one another has been something that's been part of the human condition for a very, very long time. In fact, Jesus, when he was born, was born into a context that was far more difficult than even what we live with today. He, born as a Jewish man, living under Roman oppression. And growing up, because of the Roman government, he, as a young boy, potentially, and as an adult, would have seen the expression of the, the Roman flex of power. He would, have, he would have interacted with difficult Roman soldiers. In fact, crucifixion, which is the idea of torturing and eventually killing someone on a cross, was invented roughly just a decade or two before Jesus steps into the scene and is born. Crucifixion only existed for about 60, 70 plus years in, in the span of human history as a torture tool. And Jesus steps into this first century Jerusalem context while that tool is in full swing in the Roman government in order to teach um, anyone who had thoughts about rebelling. The Roman government would literally crucify tens, dozens, hundreds of people on crosses and line them up on the street. So as you walked into a major city, you would walk by body after body being crucified. I mean, that's what, you grew, that, that's what he grew up in. The Romans had laws to oppress the Jewish people, had laws to persecute the Jewish people, and Jesus starts one of the most powerful movements that have ever hit humanity in the midst of one of the most difficult times to interact with people. In fact, one of those difficult people, a man who was committed to destroying the thing that Jesus had established called the church, spends his days as one of the smartest, brightest, most educated scholars of his day, a guy named Saul, and he's traveling around making it hard for anyone who says they believe that they believe in Jesus or that they're part of this thing called the church. And and Saul murders and arrests. He's one of these difficult people that these Christians are starting to live with the reality we have to avoid him because he's out to get us. And God does this incredible thing. He takes one of the most difficult individuals in the early church someone who literally stood against the early church, and he turns them into one of the most successful advocates for Christianity that's ever lived. Because Saul would have this incredible experience with Jesus, and he would change his name to Paul, which means small and insignificant. That Saul, who some scholars believe would have been one of the most significant Jewish men 
who have ever lived in Jewish theological circles, that he would have been a name that today synagogues would have quoted him had he not had this powerful experience with Jesus because he was brilliant and he was passionate in trying to destroy Christianity. And yet, Paul's transformed in interacting with people and God uses him to start multiple churches and to write a vast majority of the thing that we now call the New Testament. And there's one particular passage, because I think Saul has been on both sides of both being the difficult one and experiencing difficulties after because he suffered, he was beaten, he, he was ridiculed because of his faith. Saul, I think, gives us a unique picture. Paul gives us this unique perspective on how to deal with difficult people because he was a recovering difficult person. He knew what it was like. And so he writes a letter to the church in Rome, this, this church that's in one of the most powerful places on planet Earth at the time, with one of the most powerful leaders on planet Earth, a guy who literally believed he was God and who stood in opposition to everything that the Christians in that day believed. And he writes this letter to the church in Rome, and he unpacks this like long, kind of huge theological argument for Jesus and why Jesus came. But then around chapter 12, he takes this pivot, and he says, okay, because of all of this belief, here's the behaviors that reflect this belief. And in chapter 12 of what we now call the book of Romans, this letter to the church in Rome, Paul gives us a series of seven verses that I think give us an insight for how to deal with difficult people and not just deal with them and survive, but a way that can actually make a difference in the life of someone you know who is currently difficult to deal with. In fact, in the midst of unpacking, he gives us, I believe, these two critical critical and right steps that we need to have as we approach difficult individuals. Um, Romans 12 Verse 14 through 21 is where I want to kind of camp out in the midst of this morning. If you have the Encounter Church app, you can click on Sermon Notes. It'll already be there for you, um, the, the passage and the kind of a space to kind of process. Because I imagine there is someone that you're dealing with that's frustrating to you. That there is someone in your life that is a little bit of a thorn in your side. And you, you're not sure how to deal with them. But you know that however you're dealing with them needs to change. I think where you're going to find this morning is Paul gives us some insight in how to deal with difficult people. Verse 14, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate the people of low position. Do not be conceited. Let me just stop there because what you see in verse 14 through 16 is this first step, this, this, this first critical component of dealing with difficult people. And it's all about our posture and how we approach them. And and on the surface, it it can because of these loaded kind of words that aren't necessarily kind of common to our 21st century American experience, we can miss that Paul's pointing to their posture. When he says um, in verse 14, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse, we typically as 21st century Americans don't think about blessing and cursing. Now we may curse someone out, but that's a little different, right, than what Paul's referring to here. This idea of blessing and and this idea of cursing really dealt with the thought and the prayer life of the individual. You see, the Middle Eastern mindset believed that they could speak and think and pray blessings and curses against you, that they could somehow, from the way they thought, influence your life. And Paul says, look, let's start with how you think. Because the typical response, he says, bless them, not curse them. Because the typical response when we deal with difficult people is the fall in that cursing camp. See, here's how our human tendency is. We, whenever we deal with someone difficult repeatedly, we begin to simplify who they are, right? We take out the good things about them. We focus on all the frustrating bad things. And so we create this stereotype. And the stereotype's not enough. We start to not just simplify them, we begin to polarize them. We start to speak about them and us. They're they're another camp. They're a they. In fact, even if you're in a business, when, when you hear people referring to the bosses as they, 
that's usually a sign that there's already starting to be some, like, frustration or underlining tension because they made this decision. Not we made this decision, or we as an organization are going to do this, or we as a business, they decided this year, or they are laying people off. That this, you start to polarize them. You no longer see them as part of your group. You see them as this other group. And in the process of polarizing, we demonize them. And it's subtle. It's so subtle. But we stop treating, most of our disagreements with individuals are typically centered around an idea or belief or a value that they have. Right? But what happens when you demonize them is it's no longer about the idea or their perspective. It becomes about the person. This week, even in the midst of the presidential like, primary Republican debates, right, you see some of this happening where there's an us and them, but then there's the demonizing where um, you hear little Marco, right? these like subtle jabs where people, he's a liar or he's a moron, that we start to demonize an individual in the process. It gets really easy to treat them negatively. It's been the story, the tragic story of our nation for hundreds of years, the way that we've done this as a people to other people groups. That because they don't live the way we live or look the way we look or do the things we do, we simplify them, we vilify them, we polarize them, and then we demonize them. Because that's the human tendency, is to reduce someone to their worst components and then make that who they are when we deal with someone difficult. And yet, Paul says, change the way you think. Instead of that process of simplify, polarize, demonize, he says, how about generosity, empathy, and humility, right? You see that in these verses where he, he says, bless. He's like, change your mindset. It's not scarcity. It's not, a, it's not an us, them. He's like, bless. Literally, change the way you think about them from a generosity mindset. Like, I want, I want them to, like, flourish in life. I want them to thrive. I want them to experience fullness. And that paves the way for empathy, where he says, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Here's one of the ways that you know you're not doing this, right? When we fall into a trap of seeing our enemy suffer and we don't suffer with them, we rejoice, that's usually a sign that we're not practicing empathy. Because we're completely detached from them. But to be able to rejoice with someone, to be able to mourn with someone, means that there's a relationship. You're trying to understand who they are. You're trying to engage them. That you're, you're, you're attempting to not just see them as this reduction, but you're, you're trying to see them as a person. And that while you may not have agreement in everything, they still have value. And that this mindset of empathy, of trying to, to live in harmony, that it requires humility. When he says twice in verse, um, in verse 16, he says, do not be proud, be willing to associate, and do not be conceited, that there has to be a realization that we sometimes play a role in creating our own enemies in life. Right? He, he rebukes them twice and says, look, be aware that pride can slip in. If you find that you're looking down on someone, not looking out with someone with a problem, you've probably fallen into a trap of pride that you see them lower than you, lesser than you, that they're, they're just, they're not educated, they're stupid. Whatever phrase it is that you insert, but it's this process of humility gives us an ability to have conversations, be willing to learn and ask questions and see how they see the world. And that this humility, company with Empathy and generosity can pave the way of having a posture that goes in that's not defensive. Um, Jenny, um, when we, we first started dating in college, she went to an all-girls school. And, um, and so I was getting to know some of her friends, and they had this kind of gathering one night in this really cool dessert shop. And I showed up, and we were all sitting around this huge table, and uh, one of her friend's um, boyfriend sits right beside me. And we kind of do the pleasantries, like, hello. And then the night kind of goes on. It's a really loud place. It's a really hip place. And um, I'm deaf completely in this ear. Like, I can't hear anything. And as the night plays on, um, I, 
you know, we're, we're laughing, cutting up. I leave, and we're like, oh, man, that was kind of great. It was cool to meet some of your friends, and it was just kind of a full, diverse kind of group. And I was like, this is really kind of neat, and, you know, thanks so much. And, and so we went to a party a little, um, kind of about a week later, and bumped into the same guy. And it was like, hey, remember me? Hey, I'm Chris. Nice to meet you. And he's like, and I was like, oh, that bad day? <laughs> you know, like, what's up, man? Um, and I kept noticing, like, I would try to talk to him, and it was like, whatever, kind of downplay. He would avoid me. And finally, I went to Jenny. I was like, okay, maybe this sounds weird. I don't, I'm not normally one of these people, but I don't think he likes me. And, I, like, I'm not sure what to do with that because I, I met him, like, two weeks ago. And we said, like, seven words to each other. Um, and so she was like, well, I mean, I don't think you've done anything, but I'll go back and ask. And so she goes and asks her friend, and she's like, oh, your boyfriend? Oh, yeah, he's a jerk. Why? Well, he tried to talk to him that entire night, and your boyfriend kept brushing him off. He ignored him the entire night. I was like, what kind of jerk is Jenny dating? And I was like, yo, I got a disability. Like, I didn't know. <laughs> I mean, I find out, like, literally, I'm like, I can't hear anything. This thing is completely aesthetic, has no function at all. Just, just there to hold up this microphone right now. <laughs> like, that's all it's there for. And so I, I go to him, and this is where the humility kicks in. I go to him, and I say, look, man, I heard that you sat beside me two weeks ago and that we just didn't connect. I just wanted you to know, I don't hear anything out of this ear. And he's like, Psh. I was like, look, I'm not making up the fact that I'm deaf. <laughs> like, I'm really, I just can't hear you. He's like, whatever. It's like, I'm, look, I'm really sorry, man. I mean, you know, we're both dating the same girls and they're in the same circle, so we're going to see each other. I, I'm sorry. I really didn't mean to offend you. Maybe we can start over, just kind of work things out. He's like, yeah, whatever. And the reality is, is that he never really warmed back up to me. But at least I went to him and said, I, I'm sorry. Because I didn't mean to do that, but I just can't hear. And for some of us, I think realizing that the difficult people in our life, that we can take the first step in dealing with them, instead of waiting for them to realize how much of a jerk they've been, we can go to them and say, look, I just... I'm not, this isn't going to fix the problem, but I just want you to know that I, I'm sincerely sorry for the things that I've done, and I hope you can forgive me in time, but I just wanted you to know I, I realize that I'm, I'm just sorry, and that by practicing humility that we can go into conversations with empathy, and it says, you know what, I may not agree with you, I may not agree with your stances, I may not agree with your beliefs, I may not agree with how you see the world, but you know what? You're a person, and you're more than your, your beliefs. You're more than your ideas. You're more than your perspective. You're more than your upbringing. And, and I'm going to treat you with dignity because you don't debate people. You debate ideas. And when you fall into debating people, and that's what they are, that's, that the idea and the person becomes one, then you, you fall into the trap of demonizing and vilifying them. But it's not just enough that we have the right posture. Eventually, it comes into our reactions to them. And that's where um, you see Paul continue in 17. He says, do not repay anyone evil for evil, which is an assumption that evil is going to happen to you. He says, be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. You see, the typical tendency in the way we respond, it's not just this right posture. This response has to be right too because the typical response is fight, like no, you didn't. Flight, like I'm getting out of here freeze, what do I do? I've just been overwhelmed. Or fold, which is I don't care, whatever. I'm just walking away from this. That, that's the human tendency is to fight, flight, freeze, or fold. And we tend to do that really easily. It's an emotional response. But Paul calls us to live differently. He says, don't just repay evil for evil. Don't just react to them. He says, be careful, and actually the word he uses is this really interesting idea. He says, be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. That It's really easy to pass over that verse, but the, the full weight of what he's writing in this letter is this idea of Paul is calling the, the readers and even us through, through them 
to think beforehand how you're going to respond to the difficult person. It's, he's, he's calling us to premeditated benevolence. How am I going to respond when they're a jerk? How am I going to respond to my boss when he says that statement or he demeans me the way he's demeaned me in the past? Or how am I going to respond to that group of people who say stupid things? And Paul says it starts with premeditated benevolence of thinking through how to respond so that our response isn't repaying evil for evil. It's responding with good. But I love, he says, verse 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. That even in the midst of that, Paul gives a disclaimer, not once, but twice, that sometimes people are just difficult. And in the midst of coming with the right posture, in the midst of premeditated benevolence, that they still spit at you in your face. And he says, look, you do what you do. You do what you can do as far as it depends. So he's like repeating it. But ultimately, they have a role and a responsibility too. And so what do you do? He goes on. He says, do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For he has written, it is mine to avenge, and I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heat burning coals on his head. And it may be easy to read that passage and be like, I, I don't understand God's wrath. What, what Paul is saying is, look, when they spit on you, when they reject you, even with your premeditated benevolence, you've thought through everything they can say and you've got a plan for it, and they still respond the way they respond. He's like, you need to leave room and make sure that in and your interaction with them, that you allow God to remain the judge and the juror. Because what happens when we get really angry or really frustrated with someone? All of a sudden, we start, well, you know, beep, 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 or fill in the blank, or all these different thoughts. I mean, they're, they're so wrong. They're moron. They're, ah, I can't. I hope they die. I mean, you just, all this stuff, there's just this rage. Because how dare they? I tried to be nice. And we want to step into the role of judge and jury. Because it's not legal to be executor. Like, the extra, like we want to get in that role, but we're like, well, we can't do that legally in America. So I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this right now. And Paul's like, no, no, no. You're not the judge. You're not their judge. You're not their jury. God's not going to call you up to testify. Like, you just take a step back and leave some space. Because you don't know everything. You don't understand everything. Leave room for God to do what God does, which is to be the judge and the jury. He alone is the one who's capable of that. He says, your, your call, he says, on the contrary, feed them, right? Give them water if they're thirsty. He's like, your response is continued kindness and goodness in their life. Which is, he's directly quoting and intertwining Jesus' teaching that Jesus employs on the Sermon on the Mount, where in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, Jesus has got this huge gathered, crowd gathered around him, and he's teaching some of, some of his most famous words. Um, and one of the words he uses is, when someone forces you to go mile, go the extra mile. And that, over time, that's been kind of reduced down to like customer service cliche statements of like, I'm going to go the extra mile for them today. But what that was born out of was a Roman law that gave them the power to walk up to anyone. They could walk up to a Jew on the street and say, carry my bags for the next mile. And it was this oppressive thing that the Roman government employed to keep people in check. It didn't matter, matter if you're a mother with all your kids, if you had bags yourself, if you were headed to a doctor's appointment, they could walk up to you, they could force something in your hand and say, take this the next mile for me, I'm tired. And by law, you had to. And Jesus, when he's speaking to that crowd that day, he says to them, don't just go the first mile, go the second mile too. You see, the first mile was all about robbing the dignity and oppressing the person. But 
when that mile happened, and typically the Jewish man or woman would drop the bag. They're like, I'm not, you can't make me do it anymore. They walked away with their dignity still on the ground. And Jesus says, no, when they say, okay, we've been the mile, you can let it go. You hold on and say, you know what? Let me take this one more mile for you. And with every step the Jewish man or woman or boy or girl took with that Roman soldier's bag was reclaiming the dignity that that Roman soldier had, had tried to take from him. And not only was it a reclaiming of a dignity, it was actually bringing value to that person too. And so the second mile forces them to start, well, you, you don't have to do that, you know, legally. I know I want to do this for you. Well, why are you wanting to do this for me? And that second mile, was this, it was where the genius and the love of Jesus was on display. It was a revolutionary act, but it was so, so, so subtle and small. And that's what he's saying to do. Instead of responding with evil, respond with kindness. Do something good to them even if they don't care about you. Because you, you have power in that moment to value them and to reclaim value that they tried to take from yourself and your interactions with them. Martin Luther King Jr., um, many of us are familiar with Selma and the Alabama, the bus boycotts and that whole period of, of our, our history that is very much a display of, of people who have been oppressed and persecuted. But most of us don't realize that one of the things that Martin Luther King Jr. did behind the scenes that set up the integration of the buses to be successful was that Martin Luther King Jr. Um, train, held workshops and trained thousands of African Americans in the Alabama, Alabama cities where they were integrating the buses. They would have these secret meetings where they would set up seats to mimic the buses. And half a dozen people, a couple of dozen individuals would show up and they would begin to role play. Some of the individuals that would show up would pretend to be the white bus drivers. Some of them would be, um, pretend to be kind of white aggressors on the bus. And, and some were just kind of going through the motions of like, this is what it's going to look when, when the bus systems get integrated. The way we're going to win is how we respond. Because if we respond negatively, it's just going to feed this, this narrative that's completely rooted in a lie that's going to undercut what we're trying to do. And so he literally trained... Um, during the midst of these role-playing, um, deep method-acting act seminars, um, you would have passengers spitting, flicking cigarette ashes, pouring milk, cussing, squirting ketchup and mustard, hitting. All of this was happening in this like role-playing workshop that Martin Luther King Jr. did with thousands of people. And so when the buses were finally integrated... There, you didn't have these violent outbursts because they spent so much time practicing premeditated benevolence that he wanted to make sure that they were strong enough to stand and stay on the bus, but that they were rooted enough not to just react. And that instead of violence, what they found in the bus integration was premeditated benevolence. And that while many of us may not live in those circumstances, we can still respond and plan the same way of going into these circumstances with individuals and saying, you know what, I'm going to plan how I'm going to respond because my regional manager is in today and he is such a jerk. Or I'm going to have to deal with that customer today because today's their day. And this is how I'm going to respond to them. Or, this is how I'm going to deal with my child. This is how I'm going to deal with my parent. This is how I'm going to deal with my spouse when they fly off the handle. That practicing premeditated benevolence, plotting good. And maybe you're like, look, I don't want to do anything good for them. Then, then it's just starting with praying, praying good for them. I, I just want to pray good things for them. They don't have to know you're praying good things for them, but you think it. You pray it. And start up here with practicing how to respond in a way that deals with difficult people. What I love about this is ultimately at the end of the day, Paul takes all of this teaching, Romans, all these chapters build up of the way that 
Jesus demonstrates love and grace and the way that he dies on a cross and he comes back to life and how he, he overcomes all of that evil, not with violence, not with power, but with good. And that's why he finishes it with verse 21, which is his summary statement. He says, do not overcome evil by evil, but overcome evil with good. That it was born out of not just Paul's personal experience of persecuting Christians and watching how they responded to him. But it was documented again and again in Paul's life of how he lived and interacted with difficult people. But ultimately, Paul drew this out of what Jesus had modeled. When people slapped him, when people abused him, when people ultimately murdered and killed him. And here's the reality. That the early church steps into one of the most hostile environments for faith, right? Their, their leader is killed. Three days later, he comes back from the dead, and that's the game changer. But literally, their, their founder is murdered because of his beliefs and the way he lives his life. And then his followers start to go out, and they find the same opposition that he faced. People are murdering him, but people are throwing them into Colosseums to fight animals so that people can watch them be killed. But one of the beauties of the early church is that the early church had a fundamental understanding that while one of the worst days in human history happened on Friday when, they were cruci- when Jesus was crucified, one of the most glorious days in human history happened on Sunday when the tomb was empty. And that there was this realization that evil can be conquered through good. And that good, while sometimes may make you look like a doormat, it is actually one of the most powerful things that you and I can do. And that's why the early church, when they started loving and serving, in spite of the persecution, in spite of the opposition, they continued to love and serve. Every few decades, there was some major catastrophic event, whether it was an epidemic, whether it was fires, whether it was wars or siege, from like enemies, but every few decades, the Roman Empire had a major catastrophic event. And every single time there was a catastrophic event, it was the Christians who ran in and served and loved and took care of and nursed. And with each sequential moment where the Christians were able to demonstrate doing good, not responding with evil, they started to win the hearts of the people. And that the Roman Empire became the Holy Roman Empire. Not because Christians plotted some military takeover, but because the power of good always, always, always conquers the power of evil. And that that's what he demonstrated. That's that's what he experienced that changed Paul. And that's what the early church kept doing over and over and over again. And look, I will be the first one to acknowledge that Holy Roman Empire thing produced some bad things. And that there have been some wicked things done in the name of Jesus that had nothing to do with Jesus and had everything to do with people using power to further their agendas. And that perhaps even at points in history, there were Christians who in their sincerity thought they were doing things right, still did things that were completely against the heart and the message and the life of Jesus. But can I say to you, if you are here today and you are a Christian, your heritage is not them. Your heritage is what Jesus lived and modeled. Your heritage is the early Christian church who rode into disasters, who stepped up against their persecutors, and instead of retaliating with evil, they loved and they served and they nurtured and they did good. And we see glimpses every once in a while. Last year in the Charleston shooting, right, this horrible event, and you see the alleged murder standing in front of the judge and victims and family members standing in front of the camera saying to that person, I forgive you. I hope good for you in your life. And the world watched and said, how in the world do you do that to someone who killed your family? And they say, you don't understand. We believe Jesus demonstrated that good overcomes evil, that love is greater than hate, and that grace can transform any heart. That is our heritage. That is our history. And that is our present and our future, too. 
And that as we even close out today, that we're going to sing a song called Resurrecting, which is the second new song that I want to introduce. That is just this declaration that keeps us centered on the fact that Paul had hope, that the early church had hope, and it wasn't because they had a really good, solid, like, tradition or a really good idea or some really organized religious structures, but they had an understanding that Jesus rose from the dead, and that changed everything. And that confidence allowed them to step into most, some of the most difficult circumstances with some of the most difficult people and to come out on the other side victorious. And so as we respond, as we close out today, I just want to give you a, a, some time to process through that and to maybe think about that person who's, or the people who are those difficult individuals in your life and to filter how you can respond in light of having a right posture, of stepping in with the right approach, of doing good, premeditated benevolence, and being a living picture that good can overcome evil. And that one of the ways out of our confidence in Jesus for those who call Encounter Church Home, one of the ways that we respond is through offering. And I give this disclaimer every week, but I just want you to hear me. If you don't call Encounter Church Home, this, is, this offering time is not for you. We don't want anything from you. What we want for you is to be able to, to help kind of come alongside of you and help put into practice what we talk through today. That's our desire. If you're a first-time guest at Jason or referenced earlier, if there's a way we can pray for you, the Encounter Church app, you can fill out a connection card. You can let us know how we can pray for you and fight for you and walk with you. But whatever it is, we would encourage you to take this time that we've got carved out and to filter and process today's teaching, today's lesson through the lens of your life. And let's figure out how we as a people can be better together and doing good in this community. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for the hope that you bring. Thank you for the life that you have enabled. I pray that whoever those individuals are that fill our hearts and our mind, of those difficult people, that we, begin, that we would begin to see them the way you see them, that we would begin to respond the way you will have, would have responded and that we would be a force of good in light and in line with the heritage of the church that you established through your love, through your sacrifice, and through your resurrection. And it's in your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. You can stand and respond with us.
That's right. 